Hey, Bobby, good morning. Yeah, Pastor, I think it started recording. So if you could uh, kindly lead us. Well, it is about two past nine. So, yeah. okay. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, Pastor. Let's, let's, so shall we start with a word of prayer? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning once again, oh God, and every time we come before you, God, our hearts are filled with gratitude, God, and thanks and praise and worship because you have kept us alive in the first place, oh God, breathing, oh Father. And then when we come to a situation like this, Lord, we always go out to oh God with a lot of things to learn, oh God, in our lives. We thank you, God, that whenever we come with the thirst, you always quench, oh God, and you always teach us your words, oh God. You never disappoint us in a way, oh God. We want to thank you. And even today, Father, we have come here to learn, to understand, to thresh out things. Lord, we know that we do not claim to understand everything, oh God, because these are your words. But unless and until you Teach us through your Holy Spirit to God and <clears throat> give us light and revelation of God. By your Holy Spirit, Father, I know that we are not able to understand exactly what the word tells us. And so, Father, we rely on the help of the Holy Spirit as Mano teaches us and as we all together, God, learn and try to make the best interpretation of your words. I thank you, God, for this very important thing a theme of God of kingdom and covenant. And we, as we learn of Father, I pray that you would explain things to us from the various part of, parts of the scriptures. And Lord, just help us, God, to be mature in our faith. Whatever we learn of God, I pray that you would help us to reflect all those things in our lives, oh God, and be blessed and bless others, be helped and help others, oh God, to grow in that faith and to that and God, we commit all of us in your mighty and powerful hand this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor, for you know, the, the reminder. Uh, every time I speak with Pastor and when he's getting ready to preach a message or you know, every week, uh, we try to get at least one or two calls in to talk about what we're going to cover in Milk to Meet. Uh, always, we kind of go back to the, the fundamental thing as we go through these studies that there is one teacher in all of these sessions and that is the Holy Spirit. So he is the one who teaches us. We are all students at the foot of the cross at the foot of Christ, uh, you know, and like uh, Mary, that's the one thing that is needed of us. So thank you for that reminder and also for praying that we mature in our faith, which kind of resonates with one of the, the points that I'll make later in the course of this study today. So January 10th, 2021, welcome to Milk to Meet. We're studying the Kingdom and Covenant program of God. And the one that I've essentially entitled this session is the seed in the kingdom. I was actually wanting to, I'm trying to get to Exodus chapter 19. We left off last week in Genesis 50 with the, you know, with the blessings and with the death of, of Joseph from 49 and 50. And uh, I was getting through and I, I'm stuck in Exodus chapter one, which is essentially what we'll be focusing on today with regard to the seed and the kingdom and how that kind of resonates and connects to the, the, the covenant program of God. Uh, as I always start any session, you know, something to do with the law, which is the word of God that we study from. Uh, often we are kind of, we delve, we are very quick to look into the law of God, such as like the 10 commandments or the two commandments that sum up the 10 commandments and try to keep them. But the Bible reminds us in Romans chapter 13, verse 10, that love doesn't harm a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. So if you want to actually fulfill the law, which Christ has fulfilled in his entirety, as he has come and you know accomplished the work that is to be done. And now as followers of Christ, if we want to keep the law to fulfill the law, what we really need to do is to love, because love is the fulfillment of the law. And it says we need to love God and love man as ourselves. And uh, essentially, you know, this is uh, a good reminder for us that uh, that at the end of it, we can if you, you can speak in tongues of angels and and other things is what the Bible teaches us. But if you don't have love, we're just as a, a resounding symbol and hard to do sometimes, especially when people come against us. But it is nonetheless the protocol that we ought to respond with. Uh, 
love uh, in response to anything for love bears no evil it harms no harm doesn't harm the neighbor you know it keeps no record of wrong and it's patient and long suffering as we read in 1 Corinthians 13 so with that said we've been studying the threefold chord in scripture we've been talking about the kingdom chord we've been talking about the covenant chord and then the salvation chord which is you know that integrates between the two and we'll kind of see that reemerge and today actually we'll also be as we look through the scripture we'll kind of see that start to reemerge as we look at the different covenants and the kingdom program of god um, we revisited last week in the three covenants, the Edenic covenant, the Noe covenant, and the Abrahamic covenant. And then we expanded last week on the seed part of the covenant where we actually started to trace from Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, 9 and 10, that is from the line of Judah, not Joseph. And then this lion would come, right? And then we also talked about there'll be no tears in heaven, but the time was in the revelation. We read about tears in heaven because the revelation of who this lion is who is to come, that is the word Shiloh, until the one who is to come and gather his people unto himself, the one who is to come, which is the word Shiloh, the one to whom the rule rightfully belongs. We traced is actually going to come from the lion of Judah, and then the lion of Judah or the lion of Judah is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, we also looked at quickly on the death and burial of Jacob, how he expressed faith that he should be buried in the land of his father and uh, fathers. And then we saw also from the lessons of the life of Joseph that to have a forgiving heart is actually the expression of the fruit of the spirit for the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law from Galatians chapter five, verse 22. And you also saw how he expressed his faith saying that you shall not bury me in this land that is foreign where I'm a stranger, but I'm actually, you, want, you have to bury me, you have to take me. And so they embalmed his body when, when he died when he was about 110 years old. Um, we kind of expanded on the life of faith last week in terms of what it means to not live on the edge, but to live in the, in the gap between God's word and God's work, that his words will always come to be and in fruition in his due course, in due time, in his, in his appointed time. So when the appointed time came, God sent his son so that to, to be born of a woman is what it says. So everything will happen as per God's timing and his word and the delay of God does not necessarily mean that it's a non-action of God or that God or that God is dead and we'll kind of see that as we look at even the Abrahamic covenant God said there'll be a delay 400 years you'll be strangers in this land and then you will come out with great substance and you will come into this land in terms of the land land part of the covenant that is to be fulfilled so we left off in Genesis chapter 50 and when we looked at Genesis chapter 50 we were with Joseph they've uh, you know they they've gone and buried Jacob they come back and the land and Joseph also dies over there and they bury and they embalm his body and put him in a coffin is what we see in Genesis chapter 49 and 50. So where on earth are the Israelites now? In the land of? Are they in Canaan? Which is the promised land that God had told Abraham that he was going to bring them in? Or are in they in Egypt? They're in Egypt. Right. So now Exodus chapter one actually starts off where it says, now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Isaac, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls for Joseph was already in Egypt. And now the people Jacob is coming to Egypt and Joseph died there and his brethren and all his brethren, all that generation. So they all actually died in Egypt and you notice over here that the people who are supposed to be trekking into the promised land are actually in Egypt right now. Now in Egypt are they there as strangers or as servants? Now think about Joseph's life, how he was elevated to the rank, second in command to the Pharaoh and in all matters except Pharaoh's household he was akin to that of being the Pharaoh of the land. So was he a stranger or was he a servant in the land? It's only one they, did not, um, they did not become servants as yet. They are not servants yet. So they are actually still strangers at the time when Joseph dies. And it's over here when God is giving the law to the Israelites later in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33 and 34, we see that the protocol in which we treat strangers or people around us who are foreigners, it says, if a stranger sojourns with you in your land, do not vex him for the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you 
um, you know, has, that has been, has been, will be like one who's actually born among you and you shall love him as yourself. Remember the commandment, love him as yourself for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You yourselves were strangers. I am the Lord, your God. So they were strangers. They're not servants yet. But why is it important for us to ask this question? It's important for us to ask this question because God's word, when he actually gave the Abrahamic covenant, he said unto Abraham when he institutes that by the blood covenant in Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 to 15, it says that, and he said unto Abraham, know for surety that your seed shall be a stranger in the land. And that is being fulfilled with Joseph having brought into the land to save the people of the land and his own and God's own people, and that is not theirs. They'll be stranger in a land that is not there, in this case, Egypt, and they shall serve them and they shall be afflicted for 400 years, right? The Egyptians will, and that nation themselves will be judged and I will judge. And afterward, you will come out with great substance. You will come out with might and power and, and, and substance and material things. And so, and you shall go into your fathers in peace and you will be buried in a good old age. And so they are strangers. They're not at servants. And if you do a little bit of fun of math, I'm kind of, I'm, no, now I've got to tell you, I, this is it's a caveat here. I got these time from the timeline in Bible history. And if you go to Brother Srinivas's house, he's got a whole wall in his media room that goes from the book of Genesis all the way to the, uh, you know, to, to, to Revelation and the entire history that's been in his wall. Actually, I think it's in three walls. He's kind of put them together. Uh, and, and there's an online version that's similar to that, which is in the timeline of Bible history. And these dates come from there. Now, I don't want you to get hung up on the dates, but the number of years, actually, it's depending on when Abraham was born, there is kind of speculation it was in 20, 2000 BC or you know, 2000 BC or it was 1946 BC. Let's not get caught up with that. But the important thing, just kind of, I, I want to kind of emerge something out of this is as I was going through and looking at the dates that I recorded in this in this place, under the patriarchs, it talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph kind of living from 1946 BC to 1771 was, was Abraham. And then we kind of get to Joseph, which was from 1700 to 1590, uh, the 110 years that he lived. So if you were to do the math and you kind of take when Abraham started to when Joseph died, it, you know, and you take a calculator and you kind of subtract 1946 minus 1590, you come to be about 350 years, 356 years. Now, let's not get hung up with the numbers. There's speculation in terms of the date, but there is an important point for us to recognize, though, that they were 356 years or 350 some plus or minus, whatever, right? Years where in the end of Genesis, they are strangers in the land. They're not servants yet. And so there is still, God said, it'll be 400 years before you would be, you know, you would, you would leave the land. And so there is a little bit of time left. And God's word is so true that every jot and tittle, everything will come to be. And we see that where the aspect of the servants is to be fulfilled. And until all is accomplished, nothing of what God has said will pass away. And so we see that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, 18, where it says, truly, for truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not a least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear for the law from the law until everything is accomplished. And what you actually see is one day, about 2020 years ago, or 2000 years ago, you, would, you actually see that there is a loud cry, cry coming out from a, from a cross, a wooden cross. And from that cross, the cry that was, came out was tetelestai, which means, you know, which means it is finished. John chapter 19 verse 30 says that it is finished and Christ who has come has accomplished the law and from the words of Christ, from the mouth of Christ, we hear this, this declaration of victory saying that it is finished, which tetelestai can also mean it is accomplished. And so everything is accomplished then in Christ as we see on the cross. But we hear we are in the time before the coming of Christ until the Shiloh has to come. And so we see that every letter and everything that God has told us will actually happen and it will take place as he has told us it will. And so he had told 400 years, they were servants, uh, they were strangers. Now they have to be servants. And in order for that to happen, something has to change. And what happens as we start with Exodus chapter one, we'll start reading Exodus chapter one, the first six verses talks about the, the children of uh, Israel and then of Jacob, and then Exodus chapter seven, one, seven to 14, it says, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, right? And multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. 
and the land was filled with them. Notice the land was filled, but it was not the promised land where God had commissioned and counseled Jacob, Isaac not to go into because when I, Abraham went into the land of Egypt, he came back out with Hagar. And so we see over here that God is in, they are in the land and they're actually in a land that they're becoming mighty, but it is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, but it was not a land that was to be filled with them to actually for them to remain there and rule over there. And so arose a king, a new king over Egypt, who knew not Joseph is what the Bible teaches us in Exodus chapter one, verse eight. And he said unto his people, this is the king saying unto the people, behold, the children, people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Again, they shall come out with much substance is what God had told Abraham. And so the king tells, come on, let us deal wisely with them. In fact, he was going to deal very foolishly with them. But in his own eyes, he was actually thinking that he was wise. And he had this fantastic strategy that he thought was something that will actually do away with the Israelites. But God's covenant to Abraham is to be fulfilled. And so he's what he thinks is, and that's why the Bible teaches in Proverbs, the fool says in his heart and that he thinks to be wise himself right? Instead, in 1 Corinthians 3, we say, if anybody, anyone among us seem to be wise, let us become a fool because the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. And so it's important where, you know, the, the world leaders are saying, well, let's deal widely, wisely with them. And over here, Pharaoh is making that declaration, lest they multiply. A direct contradiction to the Edenic and the Noe covenant go multiply and replenish the earth go multiply and subdue the earth you know it's over here and saying let's let's not let them multiply anymore again the word from the king the new king is against the kingdom program of god in terms of what man was commissioned to do and over here as you see and it come and it shall and it came and come to pass when they if so in case there's a war that breaks out if they fall out of any war then they will join our enemies and they will actually fight against us and they will leave our land they'll get up to get themselves out of this land is what the king is thinking to himself. Therefore, he set over them taskmasters to afflict them with many burdens, with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Ramses the second is supposed to be speculated to be the Pharaoh who was ruling when the time of the Exodus took place. We are not sure exactly who the Ramses, who the Pharaoh was. Later we'll see actually what the Pharaoh essentially means. But over here you notice the people of Israel were commissioned or actually enslaved to build treasured cities, a treasured place in contrast to what you will see in Exodus chapter 19, where God gives the Mosaic covenant and he will say that you will be a treasured possession unto me. It will, you will not be, it's not a treasured place that I'm worried about or I care about. It's the treasured people that I care about, okay, that I, that I care about. And so he, he you know, we see that contrast over there. But the more they afflicted them, the more the Egyptians afflicted the people of God, the Israelites, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. From strangers, their status is now changing into being servants and slaves. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. There you go, it's slavery, enslavement, which is actually a characteristic of the false kingdom. For when Satan actually deceived Eve and Adam, he brought them under bondage, under bondage of the power of death. And so we hear their lives are bitter so much with hard bondage, a characteristic of the, the, the false kingdom or the satanic kingdom. In mortar and in brick. Now I'm going to just you know, when we do a study like this, uh, I can only be selective, not exhaustive, but I'm going to do the, give you the homework to go back and look at these words mortar and brick and how that should remind us of something. Does that, what does that remind us of? Babel. Babel, Genesis chapter 11. Let us make brick and then build this tower to reach the heavens on our own strength, on our own accord, and make a name for ourselves, not the name of God to be glorified. And so go back and kind of look at that, that significance. In fact, you would look at this, the words in terms of mortar, also tied to the Noahic, Noah's Ark, and so tar and pitch. So, so go back and do some study in that. And so it talks about, you know, saying, and they were 
they demand desire to make brick. Now they're actually forced to make brick and in a manner of service in the field, right? In the field, meaning not only building out these cities, but also in the field where cursed is the ground and out of the ground shall you actually have to bring your own food and your sustenance. The curse kind of comes being reflected over here and all their service. It mean in all things the Israelites were servants, wherein they were made, the, uh, wherein they made them, made the Israelites to serve with rigor. And so we see that the status of the Israelites changed from going being strangers to being, being um, servants. But what is something that transpires after that is unprecedented and so evil and heinous where even such a thought like this, how can it enter into the heart of man, right? Where you see an evil edict is given to slaughter or kill the babies or kill the slaughter the innocents or the slaughter the infants. Exodus chapter one verse 15 to 22, it says they made them go into hard labor and the king of Egypt. Now let's start looking at the phrases where it starts to say the king of Egypt, because there's an important aspect. We've got to notice how the king of Egypt is just three times in this whole text where it says, and the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of which the names of one was Shipra and the other was Pua. And he said unto them, when you do the office of a midwife to a Hebrew woman and see them that they are upon the stools, meaning when they're coming to the time of delivery, if it be a son, you will kill him, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not fear the king of Egypt and did not do as the king of Egypt had command, commanded them, but saved the men children alive, right? So it's important, we'll come back and trace that a little bit in terms of the men children. And the king of Egypt, called for the midwives and said, why have you done such a thing, right? And you've saved the men, children alive, which means the king came to know about what the midwives did, which to him was deception, right? In this evil plan that he had. And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, now till now we've been actually seeing that the king of Egypt is being referred to as a king of Egypt, but suddenly we see this title called Pharaoh that emerges. And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, they are lively, they're extremely strong, they're delivered before we can even get there. And so they, you know, they are able to save this one. Now, in fact, technically the, 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 um, the midwives lied, right? In terms of, or they planned it in such a way that they didn't go there in time. We don't know the details of it, how they actually said that and got away with it. But more, the, the beautiful thing is the next verse doesn't talk about how Pharaoh dealt with the king of Egypt, uh, with the midwives, because God deals with them and God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very greatly. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. So we, to, we tried so much to establish our own houses in this one. And then we tried to establish our house by you know, succumbing to the laws of the land. And it's not that I'm saying we need to be antinomial, uh, nominism in any way, but it is in the context of us fearing God when the law of the land can actually do things that can be contrary to the will of God. And so we fear God more than we fear man. We respect authority that is given unto us because all authority is instituted and given to us by God or ordained by God. For even in Pharaoh, you will later see that God's glory will be manifested. And so, and then Pharaoh now charges not just the midwives, but he charges every person in Egypt saying every son that is born you shall cast into the river and we'll hold on to that thought about the casting into the river and we'll expand on that next week and every daughter you shall save alive so now the thing that you see over here is Pharaoh actually in the Egyptian culture was considered to be an intermediary, intermediary between God and men and when he died he would actually become divine he would actually take on the form of Osiris or Horus and so he becomes a god and so the Pharaoh had a godlike status. And so we hear in this pericope, we actually notice and we see that the king of Egypt and Pharaoh are synonymously used, king of the land, Pharaoh as in a godlike status. But Pharaoh itself in, in um, uh, uh, the, the root word, it means a great house, right? A great house is what it means. And then later it came to become a title of the rulers of Egypt. But Pharaoh itself means just a great house. And so this evil edict to slaughter the infants takes place. And if you're going through and reading the scripture carefully, there are two questions that should immediately emerge for us to ask. Why male child or a son? And why is this evil edict entering into the heart of Pharaoh? So why male child? Why did he say, let the daughters be alive, be saved? 
or spare them. Do you remember when we talked about the Proto-Evangelion or the Proto-Evangelion, which is the first messianic prophecy in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, it says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now it's interesting where it, the word, the noun that is used in the English or the, the word that is used in the English, the pronoun is used, it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise thy bruise his heel. Now what is interesting is that it may seem very impersonal when we use the word it, because that's usually referred to an inanimate object or something that is lifelike, lifeless. So we don't refer to a baby as it, it is a good looking baby, right? We say he is a good looking baby or she is a good looking baby. But we, if you don't know the sex of the baby though, right, before birth, we would say something like the one who is to be born is good looking. Right, so the word it over here, when used in the scripture, if you look at the, about 50% of the time, it's used gender in specifically, where the word it could be used for the word she, or it could be used for the word he. Now God is spirit, and so he is gender in specific in terms of his essence, which means that male and female, he made them in his image. And so we see the context over there in terms of the gender in specificity of God for male and female are equal in God's eyes. And that's why God made man out of mad woman out of the side of man so that he would she would never be under his bondage, but they will be together as one flesh, they would glorify and bring glory into his, to his name. So it over here is talking about she and he, but then if you in his expression of his person in Christ Jesus, we actually see that the gender that is used is his heel. So his heel implies that this, the seed of the woman who is to come is going to be a male child. And the male child over here is being told that should be killed at birth. So the question then, the second question that we should be asking ourselves is why this evil edict? Who gave the order to actually slay the innocents in Egypt? We just read that in the in the in the previous section. What who who was the person? It was the it was the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Pharaoh is the one who reigns in Egypt, or the one who rules over the Basilia in Egypt, right? Going back to the kingdom thread. And but the question then I have to ask you is this. How did the Pharaoh even get such an idea? And in order for us to answer that question, we have two more questions that we need to ask and answer, which is who rules over this world and how, is, how does this being who rules over this world rule this world? So the question then is who rules over this world? Satan. Satan. Thanks, Ruben. So in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the second part of the verse very clearly shows that we know that we are of God, those who are in the faith, those who are in the kingdom program of God, those who believed in Jesus Christ. We know that we are of God. We belong to him. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In fact, I like the, the picture on the right, which talk, kind of looks at it almost like you know, the world is being manipulated and controlled by the evil one because it's under the influence of the evil one. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, we actually refer to him, refer to, to Satan, not just as the king over this world, as the Pharaoh was over the king of Egypt, as the, as, as the Pharaoh was over, over as the king of Egypt, but also he's referred to as the God of this world. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, talking about those who cannot see the gospel, where you notice and see in whom the God of this world, talking about Satan has blinded the minds of them who believe not. Those who have believed are no longer in darkness. We are walking in the light or we are in the light and we're expected to walk in the light. And so, but the, those who are not believing or choosing not to believe in Jesus Christ, it's actually that the God of this world has actually blinded the minds of them is what this is. Why? So that the glorious gospel of Christ. Remember earlier when we studied the kingdom, we talked about how the king is synonymous to the word glory. And so when Saul dies, David actually ex expresses in the book of Joshua, as it is written, it, 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 it expresses and he says, oh, the glory of Israel has been killed, right? Or oh, the mighty have fallen, or oh, the mighty the mighty have fallen when, when Saul and Jonathan died. So over here, the glorious, which means the kingdom gospel of God, of Christ, who is the very image of God should shine on them. And so they can be brought into the light and not no, no longer continue to grovel in darkness. But he, Satan over here talked about how he rules over this world. 
and he has established himself to be the god of this world. Now, the question then is, how does this being rule over this world? So to answer that question, where is this person ruling from, right? So where is this person ruling from in the context of, uh, where is he? Is he in hell? Is he ruling from hell? It says he walks to and fro on the surface of the earth. Yeah. So 2 Peter 2, 4 actually talks about how God has sent the disobedient angels who did not keep their habitation, most likely a reference to Genesis chapter 6, where they intermingled with men and then came out with Nephilim or the disobedient angels, where they are changed into judgment. But then not all the fallen spirits are actually uh, uh, chained in judgment because we know in the possession of the girl, the demonic girl, where uh, when Christ exorcises her, they cry out and they say, do not send us into the abyss because in the abyss is where the angels who are disobedient are chained whereas they say send us and so he sends them into the swines but we see that the, 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 there are angels who are reserved in hell, who are chained in hell. And then we also see about in Matthew chapter 25, 40 to 41, the king answered and sent it to them, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Then he shall say unto them that are on the left, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, into hell, prepared for the devil and his angels. So the devil is going to be cast into, you know, into, into hell and, uh, you know, those who are teaching the book of Revelation, I know Brother Srinivas says in Revelation chapter 20, when you get to it, you'll see how he'll be cast into the lake of fire, right? And then the old kingdom program of God will be where eventually he'll be cast forever and ever. But right now, as Reuben said, he's walking to and fro on the earth. And it says, because God says in Job chapter one, verse seven, when God is asking Satan, where have you come from? Where comest thou? And the Satan, then Satan answered and responded to the Lord. And he said, from going to and fro in the earth and notice the dimensions, to and fro is kind of can be thought of as the east and west. And then from walking up and down, north and south, in, in essence, the entirety of the earth is his domain over which he exerts his dominion. But this also establishes a very important point for us to recognize. And that point is this, that Satan is finite, a created being, and he is not omniscient. And because of that, he cannot rule over the whole earth by his own physical presence all over the earth. So how does he then end up ruling over this world? He ends up using you know, agents such as the fallen spirits, and we'll see that in a second as to the evidence from the scripture, and he uses fallen subjects, those who are in his kingdom, those who are still lost, talking about the people is itself. And we'll see, we'll see a couple of examples of that. So how does he rule using fallen spirits? He, starts, he rules using fallen spirits, using the principalities. So a principality is the word that is used for somebody who's got an authority over a particular region. And that could be a title as that of a prince or a king. And Daniel chapter 10 gives us some clue and some evidence of how Satan orchestrates or uses his rule by influencing, leveraging fallen spirits. And we see that in the context of uh, Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel is praying after he has this vision, he's kind of really scared or he's upset and he's praying. And the, the Bible teach says that, you know, then said he unto me, fear not Daniel for from the first day, from the day that you started praying, when you set your heart to understand these things and to humble yourself before God, to chasten yourself before God, your words were heard. And I came for those words. God sent me, he dispatched me right when you were praying your words as they were heard. I was asked to come to you, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which stood me 21 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So think about what's happening. Angel is sent to give the message to bring it to Daniel, who's humbled himself. There is a prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, there are speculations as to how we can actually interpret this, and I won't go too into the details, as much as, much as to understand that the prince of the kingdom of Persia could be just a prince who was being influenced by a demonic spirit over there, or it could be a demonic spirit that is given charge over a particular land, over a particular area, as was Pharaoh who had rule over Egypt, so did kings and princes have, because you notice over there, it says in the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, I believe, this is my, my conjecture, that this was a demonic spirit, because because this demonic spirit was withstanding an angelic being from God. And in Ephesians chapter 6, we see that our, you know, we put on the full armor of God so that we can stand against whom? The devil's schemes or the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not flesh for fight against flesh and blood. It's not against human and human, war against man and, you know, 
man and man, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And so the intersect of the spiritual and the physical is established in this warfare and the warfare that began with the declaration of the war cry in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, the proto evangelion where it talks about the war where the this, this one who is to come, the Shiloh who is to come to whom the rule rightfully belongs is going to actually crush the head of the serpent, crush Satan. And Satan over here is orchestrating everything to fight against God in the spiritual realms, in the spiritual uh, heavenly places. And so we see over here the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which should be, and then I remain there with the kings of Persia. So prince and kings, it's talking in singular and plurality. It could be that there were angelic forces or demonic forces that were influencing over these people who were ruling in the land. Or, and that's kind of the most plausible way. Then said he, and then in verse 20, you know, it says, then said he, knowest thou where I come from, wherefore I come unto you. So I'm coming to you from God. And now I will return and fight with the Prince of Persia. And when I'm gone forth, the Prince of Greece will also come. And so it's talking about how this warfare continues over the land and the dominion of the land. And why this is important is it's got undertones to the kingdom program of God in terms of how Satan is actually fighting against God in the heavenly places. Now, we also see that the rule is the rule of God, uh, rule of Satan. He uses fallen subjects or fallen mankind, people. And we see that with two examples, two classic examples. Judas is one and Peter is another. And in Judas, Luke chapter 22, verse 2 to 5, it says, And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas' son, surname Iscariot. Being one of the being of the people, number of the twelve, and he went his way. And notice what Judas does: he goes his way. He communes with the chief priests who are trying to eliminate the seed of the woman, how he might betray betray him. So not just communal, it's betrayal. And they were glad and they covenanted to give him money. Notice the words of God in His Holy Scripture by the beautiful inspiration of the Holy Spirit brings us to attention that the people promised each other to eliminate the seed, the seed of the woman who would crush Satan and the seed of the woman through whom all nations shall be blessed as part of the Abrahamic covenant. And here they're trying to eliminate Christ the seed by covenanting to in opposition to the covenant of God himself. And, but it says over here how Satan has the ability to enter into a person. Now, it's not just talking about possession. I love the picture on the right because it's almost like, you know, and I don't, don't get carried away with the horns on his head and all because the Satan is a, a angelic being and he is, uh, he can masquerade as the angel of light. So it's, it's the European way of rendish, renditioning of the Satan with a pitchfork and a long tail, a diabolical tail and the, the horns. That's not the picture you should have a Satan. You could think of Satan just as another being. And, you know, and, and he's over here, like almost he's kissing um, Judas, who then gives the kiss of betrayal to, to, to Christ. And so the influence that Satan had. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that Satan has no power over us or over humankind unless it has been allowed by God. That's why he has to ask permission to God before he can do anything to impact man. So when he had to impact Job, that's what happened. He had to ask permission. And so he's, lim he's limited in his power, but he can tempt us. You know, he tempts us as the Bible teaches us that by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, he tempts us. The choice is still ours to make. And so the choice as it, as it was for Adam and Eve, Judas had a choice. And then it says when he entered as Judas, essentially means that he had the ability to be able to enter into the land or the heart of Judas to be able to control it and to be able to do his bidding. And we see in the, in the Gospels also with, with another example with Peter, where Peter is being told and Jesus is telling Peter that I have to go into Jerusalem. And from this time forth began Jesus to show unto his thing in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to 23. It says that Jesus, Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things, and you know of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and we killed meaning to say that the blood covenant has to be established the blood has to be shed and he will be resurrected on the third day then peter actually takes him aside and he starts to rebuke him which is with the audacity that peter has it's just fascinating how he takes to, to god the seed of the woman and he says to christ nothing like that can actually be right be it far from you lord that there shall be unto you meaning to say that the man that you know you should not die you cannot be and and then 
Jesus turns to Peter and said unto Peter, rightfully, if we were reading this and if I was authoring this, this, this account, I would have had to write, get thee behind me, Peter. Instead, if you notice how God is referring to Peter is, get thee behind me, Satan, knowing very well that it was Satan who was standing behind Peter to influence Peter into saying that the, the way of redemption does not need to happen in Christ, the seed of the woman. So that what an offense unto me is what Jesus is telling us in, into Satan now. You savor things not of God, but of man, fallen subjects. And so we see over here how the rule of Satan is actually essentially being done through his fallen spirits and through his fallen subjects and through the fallen subject. And we notice actually that the devil is back to his tricks and his schemes, because just as the slaughter of the infants in the book of Exodus chapter one was done, asked by an evil king, that evil edict, we see that the devil's wiles hasn't changed. Herod is now being used, another ruler of the land, another king of the land over here now in God's land in itself, right in Israel, is being used where the devil is trying to eliminate the seed of the woman. And Matthew chapter 2 verse 12 to 16 says, where if you read, Herod will seek this young child to destroy you. And God's beautiful plan is so that God then gives a dream to Joseph and says, take the mother and the child by night and you go into Egypt and then it will be fulfilled as that which is being fulfilled of the of the prophets that out of Egypt have I called my son because then Herod actually ends up going and slaying all the children that were in Bethlehem in the house of God which is the house of bread the Bethel is house of God the greatest house right where God is worshipped as we saw with Abraham and with Isaac when they came back and Jacob when they came back when he came back into the land and he called the place Bethel and here you notice how God how the devil is orchestrating the plan to eliminate the seed and God's like using the same out of Egypt I call my son out of Egypt he's, go, he's going to call his children very soon as we'll see in the book of Exodus and so the massacre of the innocents what I'm trying to say is that while the rulers of the land established certain edicts the devil in the back was essentially trying to orchestrate all these things in his in his attempt to keep the kingdom program of God and the covenant program of God from coming into fruition. And so it's important for us to keep that thread always. And you start to see that the seed of the woman Christ is the one who, will, who is to come and he will be the come who will come and he will you know, vanquish and defeat Satan completely. Now, I want us to also recognize one other thing. When I ask you the question about um, what comes to mind when Jesus is predicting the denial of Peter? Uh, what are the things that come to mind? You often you would think of the campfire, the girl who accused him, or who said that he was one of his disciples, how um, Peter vehemently, you know, almost uses swear words, I guess, to, to refute his position that he's not one of the disciples of Christ. All those things come to mind. But I want us to recognize something. If we read the scripture too carefully uh, and and, and, and slowly, there are certain truths that will emerge before Jesus tells Peter that he's going to deny him. There's a conversation that takes place with Peter. And this is what it says. And he tells all his disciples and he says, you are they, this is from Luke chapter 22, verse 28 to 34. It says, you are they which have continued with me in my trials or in my temptation. It actually talks about the sufferings of Christ. And I appoint you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto you. That should actually immediately make us go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, where the father is the ancient of days is giving unto the son, into the, into the one who's standing before him, Christ, the, the, the kingdom that will last forever, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on those thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And that talks about the wedding supper of the lamb. In Revelation chapter 19, we get a glimpse of that. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Notice over there he had referred to Peter as Satan. Here Jesus is saying, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Satan has desired to have you. But I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, you know, you'll deny me, 
and then you will come you will strengthen your as you are expected to strengthen the brethren that their faith fail not that is the mission of christianity while we bring people into seeing who christ is we also encourage and we strengthen our brethren so that our faith does not fail and he said unto him lord i am ready to go with you both into prison and to death and jesus tells peter i tell you peter the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shall thrice deny me that you know me your faith will fail and then it will be strengthened just because your faith failed in me you know because you're going to look at yourself to be more important because you say i'm going to give my life for you but you're going to actually not just be imprisoned and enslaved he's saying that he is going to be you know he says he says that i'm going to be willing to go to enslavement and even death and jesus is saying no that will not be the case but what i want you to recognize is this that the saints that satan is always desiring to have those who are in the fold of god who is desiring to sift us like wheat to sift us like wheat means to make our faith fail not to allow, not to help have us have, have the faith of abraham who believed god and it was credited to him as righteousness to sift us as like wheat is like in the psalm chapter 1 it says you know and like the shaft that the wind blows away he wants us to shift us to make us like shaft so that we will have no impact at all in this world or in this in, in the kingdom program of god and so he's saying simon simon now put your name there and say mano mano or sangeeta sangeeta ruben ruben eta eta or pick your name and put it over there and say satan is desiring to have you that he may sift you as wheat but here's the good news god christ is interceding for us and saying that you know he is the intercessor intercessor in heaven for us this man jesus christ is mediating and he's saying let their faith not fail and when our respected is when we are when we have that converted experience we ought to strengthen our brother and meaning those who are others who are in the in the fold that be the barnabas and the encouragers to others around us so you can either stand with christ in the suffering of christ or be sifted is what this establishes and so in summary god's word will happen as he states it the israelites were strangers and they would become servants just as god had said christ jesus has accomplished or finished the work on the of god tetelestai was his declaration that kind of goes hand in hand with the proto evangelion the declaration of the serpent being crushed by the seed of the woman the devil has been trying to eliminate the seed of the woman since the proto evangelion which is very interesting because although we think why is this edict evil edict the devil is kind of orchestrating to disrupt the kingdom program of god and then the devil uses fallen spirits and fallen subjects to rule over this world because he's not omni omnipresent i may have said omniscient if i did i apologize but he's not omnipresent and so you know and the devil desires to shift the people of faith that shift the people of faith so that their faith will fail and those who share in the trials or the suffering with Christ will serve in his kingdom will rule in his kingdom so making this all personal and then i'll open this up for some times of questions and 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 sharing and thoughts is are you a stranger to god in other words are you a slave to sin in this land if you are here you may have attended christ you know churches but never actually personally accepted christ if you are here and never accepted christ believe in the lord jesus christ just as as you are and become his son and his daughter no longer slaves no longer strangers but sons and daughters in the kingdom of god in the in the house of god in the bethel itself if you are a child of god pray that our faith fails not because the devil desires to shift shift our faith are you willing to continue or share in the sufferings of christ what that really means is you know we will are you willing to suffer for the name of christ for christ's sake for christ's name remember the reward is out of this world in his kingdom right the retirement benefits for us are out of this world to serve and to rule in god's kingdom program and so to be with him and to and to rule with him and so it is important for us to recognize that with that said i'm going to open it up for a time of questions observations thoughts comments and um any any anything else <clears throat> i i can only identify with it mano yes okay thanks charles it's a honest confession i think we all can right so yes, especially in how much are we willing to stand by what is true in a culture that's increasingly anti christian right are we willing to stand by and say i'm willing to lose my job because of what i believe or i'm willing to let go of all these precious things 
that we think is precious. Uh, I, I see a little bit of Peter in myself uh, every time that I, I reach the decision point. Right. It's very, very nice. Anything else? Um, anyone else have any comments, any thoughts? Hey, Mano, one thing I would, uh, as an encouragement that I, I mean, I completely agree in terms of this is Charles is just being bold in confessing. And I think uh, the same thing here, uh, and I'm sure others as well. Um, the good news is we know that Jesus prays and he will never let Satan destroy our faith. Right, right. And so the, he can try to valiantly attempt in terms of bringing and dragging as a result of the process of you going through the sifting. However, he cannot destroy that unless there is something that we kind of go down the spiral down real. But still, we know that Jesus is on our side. That is the hope. And he, as long as we have that grounding, as long as we continue to do our part in praying and seeking God, right, that right. is a futile attempt. It's, it's interesting to say that, that, as Brother Josh was saying, right, God, Christ Jesus is on our side. He's never let us, nor will he ever forsake us. That doesn't mean we will not go through the sifting that is necessary. And so it's actually interesting because when, Jesus, when God is asking Satan, have you considered my servant Job? What Job was actually being told as a testament by God himself was, this person is the person who loves me. Right? It's an expression of our love. Our faith essentially is an expression of our love to say that no matter what, he's not going to you know, deny me. He's not going to let go of his faith in me. And so as, as Josh, you were saying, uh, now, now it's important that through that sifting, sometimes we can actually fall, but God never condemns. And that's why Peter is told, you're going to actually deny me. Jesus knew that what that his faith will fail. But then when you are converted, when you realize the folly of your ways, of your choice, then you are going to come and you are going to be a strength unto my brethren. So that's the beautiful thing in this whole thing is that Christ, like you know, Josh, as I said, Christ is on our side. I was talking to Brother Srinivas when we had done the, the study of the will of God and Srinivas was, Brother Srinivas was saying, one thing we need to keep in mind is that the choice is still ours. God's will is to be, and we can choose to be in the will of God or not. And so that kind of also comes into picture over here. And, and as Christ is praying for us, we ought to be also watching and praying that we fall not into temptation because really the sifting of the wheat or the sifting of us is the devil trying to tempt us to not be in the kingdom and covenant program of God. Right. With that said, if, if, does anyone have any other questions or else we can close and then we can close the word of prayer. So we are in time and then we can continue to hang on if, hang out if uh, anybody else has anything else to share, so. Oh, I'm happy to pray. Pray, please. Father God, thank you so much for this wonderful yeah. study. Lord, Father, we uh, praise you for uh, like communicating through uh, Manona during this uh, Bible study, Lord. We pray that the words will uh, work in us the way you want us to, want those words to work in us. And we pray that you would uh, help us um, be an example to you and be, be an example, uh, be a true Christian example to others and be able to um, impress them uh, through Christianity and bring them into your word, Lord Father. We give praise to you for protecting us and we pray for protection of everyone here and bless them and be with them in Jesus' most precious name. We ask and pray. Amen. Amen.